On today's episode, I'm going to show you some techniques that might be difficult for some woodworkers, but I'm going to break it down and make it nice and easy. Now, before I get going on today's episode, I want to thank the folks over there at Woodcraft. For almost a hundred years, Woodcraft has the right people with the right tools to help you get the job done right. Woodcraft, helping you make wood work. I also want to thank Kencraft. Kencraft is where I go and buy all my domestic and import hardwoods. They have a large selection and great prices. Order from them online and they'll ship it right to your door. So this is part three of my mid-century dining room table build. Now if you didn't see part one and two, don't worry about it. I got the links in the description below. But you don't have to watch those to watch this episode. I've been taking each part of this video series and breaking it down into individual lessons. Now in this episode, I'm going to show you how to make a perfect, gradually descending tapered leg. I'm also going to show you how to put an angled mortise into that round tapered leg, which requires a little bit of geometry and a very easy but simple jig. And then last, I'm going to show you how I hand cut my tenons to fit that mortise. Okay, without further ado, let's pick up where I last left off. So I'm ready at the point with this table to turn the legs. And turning the leg is pretty straightforward. I'll go through that in a minute. The part that I had to spend some time thinking about was the mortise. The question was, do I make the mortise first and then turn the leg, or do I turn the leg and then make the mortise? Now there's pros and cons to both with it. Now when I built the desk, I started with the material in the square stock and I used the domino fest tool to make the plunge cuts to make the mortise. And it worked well, except for one leg, I had a little bit of problem. The problem was, when I went to put the domino in it, it wasn't straight. It actually was on an angle, which means the plunge cut went in wrong. Now, where did that happen? It could have been a couple of things. It could have been on my square stock that maybe I didn't have the domino fest tool on there properly. Maybe I had it tilted. Maybe my stock was a little bit twisted and thereby when I turned it then it was off. And maybe too when I set it up on the lathe I didn't have it right in the center of my stock. Maybe it was off a little bit. I don't know what the problem was. So I decided I'm going to turn the leg and then make the mortise. And setting that up, well, that's going to be a little bit tricky, and I'll go over that when we get to it. Right now, let's get set up for turning the leg. I found the center of my stock, and then using the spurred uh, center point on the headstock of the lathe, I went ahead and striked it in there. And it's important to carry these lines all the way out to the edge now, because these lines are going to help us when it comes time to put the mortise in. I have my square blank here chucked up in the lathe and obviously the first thing I got to do is knock off these corners and get it round uh, which should give me just slightly over a two inch diameter. And so I'm going to use this big old beefy uh, roughing gouge to, to do the work. Okay, I pretty much got it all the way down to my uh, two inch diameter. And now I'm gonna put some, a um, couple of measurement marks up here at the top. I'll explain that in a minute. But I know that my leg is gonna be 28 inches long when it's done. So this is a little bit longer, I got this at 31. And I also know too that the, the bottom as it tapers down, it's gonna be uh, around seven eighths. It's gonna go from two inches down to seven eighths. So, I'm just going to remove a lot of material in the meantime. So far what I did was I roughly tapered this down 
and we want a nice smooth gradual descent from two inches down to seven eighths. And I don't know if you can see on the camera, but I marked this off in different increments. So this is the bottom uh, of the, the leg. And then seven inches up, I made another mark, another seven, seven, and then the top. So every seven inches, I have a mark that divides up my 28 inches. And then what I do is I have a pair of calipers here, and each one is set slightly larger. So I got a one inch, inch and a quarter, inch and a half, uh, inch and three quarters, and of course then two at the top. Uh, now I set it for an inch even though I said seven eighths because odds are probably when I'm trying to uh, use the skewing uh, chisel on it to get it really smooth and then by the time I sand it I have a feeling I'm going to be under one inch. Okay, so what's up next is to use the parting tool and I have different calipers already set. I got a whole bunch of calipers. Each one is set at its perspective measurement. That way I don't have to keep uh, taking one pair and readjusting them in size. All right, so now I'm gonna make my marks. Okay, so now what I have to do is I have to shave down to those marks and that'll help give me a nice gradual even taper to the leg. And now I'm gonna remove uh, again more of the bulk because especially right here at the inch and a quarter, uh, I've got quite a bit to remove. So I'm just gonna still keep using the roughing gouge for this. But then when I wanna try and get it real smooth, uh, I'm going to switch over to the skew chisel and try and try, try and get it uh, nice and clean looking. That looks pretty good. I mean, I'm not a great turner, but that came out pretty good. All right, one done, three to go. Okay, I'm at the point where I'm ready to put the mortises into this tapered leg. Now, before I just rush over to my machine and start putting these holes in it, I have to factor in a couple of angles. And so let me explain by referring back to the model. So from the front of this table, you can see that the legs they splay out, and this is at six degrees. Also on the sides, the legs have a rake going out of six degrees. And then of course you have to factor in that the leg tapers down from two inch down to one inch, which means that this apron going into it up here, that angle has to be right for both directions so this all goes together right. So let me show you the jig that I'm using to help figure this all out. Remember when I told you it was important to have that cross on both ends of this leg? Well, here's why. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna take one of those lines and you're gonna draw down it till it connects to the other point on your cross. What this does is it now establishes the middle of this leg as it tapers down. Okay, now let me show you the jig. So here's the jig. Uh, nothing really fancy, it's just some scrap wood. Uh, on the bandsaw, I cut the angle so it slopes at that six degrees, have a fence on the back. And then I just took one of these 
wooden clamps and screwed it to the fence. That way when I set the leg in there, uh, it will hold it in place. Now it would seem that I could just go up to the mortising machine, line up the bit with my center pencil line, and start making my cuts down into it. But there's actually another problem here. It's starting at six degrees up here where the leg is at the full two inch, but then I have to account for the slope and taper of the leg. So when I get down here and I'm cutting in, I'm not cutting in at six degrees anymore. So what I need to do is I have to get the pencil line turned at 90 degrees. And I'm measuring from the base of my jig up to that line. And it's reading like an inch and a quarter. Now I made a small little V block. And I'm going to place that here at the bottom. And as I move the V block up, you can see it's raising the height of that leg. So all I'm going to simply do is I'm going to measure at the other end of this leg until that V block shows it. Clamp this in here so it doesn't move. Going to raise this up and down until my V block is at inch and a quarter. Okay, great. There it is. Now I'm going to put a screw in there and lock that in place so it doesn't move while I'm using the mortising machine. There's one last thing that I want to check. Uh, it's not really going to be a factor as far as throwing any angles off. It's just going to be easier when I put this in the mortising machine. So let me change the angle on the camera so you can see what I'm talking about. All right, in addition to raising the leg up so that center line had the same distant measurement from the bed of the jig to the middle of the leg, I also have to take into account that against this back fence, it's also following the angle of this leg. So once again, what I'll do is I'll rotate the center line now facing up again, where we need it to be anyways to put the, the mortise in. And then what I want to do is I want to measure at the top the, from the edge of the edge of the back of the fence to that center line. Okay, so I got like inch and three quarters. And then what I'm going to do is I come down here and same thing, I have to measure over from the back of the fence. As it is right now, that's at inch and a quarter. So this actually has to move out another half inch. So when I made this little V block, not only is this allowing me to raise the leg up, but I also cut it so it gives me that same measurement from the back of the fence to the center all the way down this. That way when I put in the mortising machine, I can just slide it down and make the mortises as I need it. So here's the jig in the mortising machine. Uh, what I did was I also screwed a piece of wood to the table uh, of the mortising machine. That way I can easily move it up and down, keeping that center line there. And you can also see this clamp. What that's doing, the clamp is holding the leg from rotating. So you can see that when it comes down, man, I'm right, right on that line. So, okay, I'm good to go. So if you ever watched a lot of my show, you'll notice that I always say I like to make the, 
the mortise first instead of the tenon. And the reason for is, here's a great example. Somehow I must have got off a little bit and you can see that this edge is not as clean as the other side. So what I'll do is I'll take a chisel and go in there and clean that up. If I made the tenon first, then the tenon would be uh, the wrong size and it would be really sloppy in there. So this is why I make the mortise, then I measure the mortise and fit it exactly to what the tenon should be. I'm going to show you the uh, steps in the order that I'm doing for the upper stretchers. Now this is the shorter one, but this procedure will be exactly the same for the long ones as well. Okay, so here's my board and on the miter saw, I already cut it at that six degree angle that I want. I don't know if you can see the pencil line on it. So this is this is a pencil line here for the part of the apron to then where it swells up. So I got to put that radius on. So I'll start with that. So this is really easy. I just took my compass. I measured from the top edge of the board to that line. And I'm going to bring it over here and make a little mark. Okay, now I'm going to turn this around, put the point on that mark, and make the curve. Pretty easy. All right, so I'm going to do that on uh, both ends and actually both sides because I'm going to cut this out in, on the bandsaw, and I have to flip the board over actually to kind of maneuver it because of the length. So. Um, I'll do that and then we'll do some layout for the tenons. So at this point I'm going to use my, uh, this is a Wood River marking gauge and this is going to define how long the tenon is going to be. I'm going to do this on both sides. And then I have this marking gauge. This is actually a pretty old one uh, from the 1800s. But it has two pins on it. And what this allows me to do is to define how thick, how wide the tenon is going to be. Now, I did take a, a, a block plane and smooth this and make sure it's flat. I'm, I'll clean all that up later. Uh, right now though, I want to make sure that this is smooth, flat, and square because I'm going to need that uh, for my bevel and I'll show you that next. So the piece is clamped down to my bench and I'm going to use two things. I'm going to use the, the bevel, which we still have set at that six degrees, and I'm going to use my uh, flex cut chip carving knife. I, I really like this. I use it all the time. In fact, uh, this is one of the main reasons why I use this. So I'm going to put the knife on the pencil line, bring my bevel up to it, and now I'm going to score the line each time, pressing a little bit deeper. I do it three times. All right, now I need to make a trench for a place for the saw to sit in. So I'm going to angle the knife and just shave out a small little piece. And as I get to the end, I don't keep pulling because this could um, you know, come off. I get real close to the end and then I push it down into there. All right, so that gives me a, a nice sharp wall on the side for my saw to lay in. So where's my saw? So now I'm going to saw down till I get to that tenon. And then I'll flip it over and I'll do the same thing to the other side.
okay, here comes the tricky part in my opinion. So I have to saw down this line and also as I'm sawing, keep to that line. Now what I'm going to technically do is I'm going to saw kind of on an angle till halfway, turn it around. I'll do the same thing, saw at an angle like that about halfway, and then come back with the saw and go down straight for it. But I still have trouble doing it even in that order. Here's why. Because my marking gauge already scribed this line in here, my saw wants to start right in that groove. And that's not good because the thickness of my blade is also going to cut on this side of that tenon. And you do it to both sides. Now this tenon is actually skinnier than what I want. So the way I get around that is, uh, back to my knife again, not on the line, but just a little bit more to the right, just a little bit. I'll push the knife in, come over on the angle, pull out a chip. Okay, I don't know if you can see that, but in theory now, what I want to do is I want to I get my saw started and I want to cut leaving that tenon a little fat, a little wide. And then I can sneak down to this line, uh, which I'll show you next. But right now, let me try and do this. And just to warn you, it's probably going to look ugly. Okay, now I'm just going to try and cut down straight with it. Hopefully my saw stays in those kerf lines. So there's one side, I'll do the other, and then I'll show you the next step. Okay, I don't know if you can tell on the video, but there's some rough spots, some high and low, and as I said, the tenon is slightly fatter than the mortise hole to fit it in. So there's a couple ways that I can get that down to my marking gauge lines. The first most economical way is using this here Shinto rasp. I like this a lot. I use it often. In fact, this is what I used uh, in the very beginning when I was uh, trimming up my tenons. And so it's basically like a bunch of bandsaw blades. I have a real coarse side on one side and finer teeth on the other. And so what I like about this is you can see it pretty much covers the whole size of the tenon face there. And I can keep this flat and slowly work down to my lines. It does a good job. Uh, you have to be careful not to roll the rasp at all, um, but if you take your time, go slow, it'll do the job. All right, the next tool that you can use, the most popular one probably, is this here shoulder plane by Veritas. It's very nice, it does a good job. You go across and it will uh, trim the tenon down. These though can be a little tricky because of the weight, the size of it, so as you're going across, it's real easy as you're planing to turn this, tilt it, and then your tenon is not straight, all right? So the last way I'll show you uh, is a way that works great and it's incredibly precise. So the last way is to use a router plane. What I like about this is it's not only really precise, but I can slowly sneak up on how much I wanna shave off, and I can do uh, both ends of this piece as well as flip it over and it'll always keep the, the tenon 
uh, right in the middle of the workpiece. Okay, so one of the things that's important to have with this is a scrap piece of wood. In fact, this piece of wood is actually what I cut, cut off of the stretcher here, so I know it's exactly the same size. And what I'm going to do is that's going to be support for the other side of my router plane, and now I can just work my way across. Works really nice. Okay, so I just do a little bit at a time. I check it in the mortise, see how it fits. Uh, obviously, I, I do both sides, check it in the mortise, see how it fits, and then just keep coming back and slowly sneaking up on it so I get a real nice fit. All right, so I'm going to try fitting this together just the way I like it. Snug, but not tight certainly not loose. Now I'm going to work on the lower stretchers next. Uh, as far as this gap, I will deal with that later once I get all the parts fit right. Uh, and you've seen me do that before too. I'm ready to measure for the lower stretcher here. And I don't like using a regular tape measure for this because I do have to get to the inside of that. And yeah, I could probably go from the bottom Let's see here. Um, yeah, I could go from the bottom like this and try and read it, but what I really like using for inside measurements is one of these folding rulers that has this extended arm on it. Place that in there, measure that out, and then I take the numbers on the end of this scale and I add it to the numbers that are on the separate scale here. So in this case here, I got 31 and that's 4 inches, 4 and... and 4 inches, so it's telling me I got 35 inches. All right, so from there I went and made my stretcher. Now, keep in mind that 35 inches is from point to point here, does not count the tenons. So you have to make sure that you measure in each one of the mortises and add that on to your piece before you cut it. All right, so let me put this together and show you something that I missed and didn't calculate for. So I have both stretchers in this and I know we have some uh, gaps up there. We're not worried about that. We're going to fix that later. Uh, what I do want to though, I do want to show you something in particular on this uh, gap and, and the mistake that I made. Now keep in mind that these legs are splayed out at six degrees. However, that six degrees from the center line of the leg. Remember that six degrees from the center line of this leg. All right, now let's let's take a look at this gap closer. Okay, besides the tenon itself being a little bit too long, I gotta trim that up so it comes in closer. But take a look at this. You can see that the gap up here is smaller than the gap down here. And why is that? Well, that's because as this leg gets smaller at the bottom, it's not quite six degrees anymore. It was six degrees from the center. It's not six degrees from this edge. So let me show you how I'm gonna figure out exactly what that angle is. Here's how I'm gonna figure out not only the angle for the stretcher, but the exact length for it. So let me zoom in a little bit tighter here and show you what we're going to do. To figure out the angle, uh, I could just probably simply take my pencil and put it against the leg and ride against it, and that would, that would give me the angle for it, and then I could just put my uh, bevel on it and, fig and figure out what that is. But the problem I also have too is 
the leg is round. So I want to make sure that I'm right at this outside edge of, of it being round. So the way I'm doing that is I'm, I've got this marking knife and you can see there's a bevel on this side. It's flat on the back and then with my square, I'm going to try and do this where my hands aren't in the way so this might be a little awkward for me. But I'm going to put the bevel, or I'm sorry, I'm going to put the marking knife so it's flat right against the, the leg and to make sure that I'm not, uh, you know, under it a little bit or away from it, I'm going to use the square to make sure that it stays straight, okay? So now I'm going to put a little pressure and make a mark there and then come down here, do the same thing. All right, now I could just kind of pull this away. And that would be my, uh, just connect those two lines. That is my angle. And just out of curiosity, I want to see how far off it is. So this was my bevel sit, set at uh, 6 degrees. And I'm just kind of curious. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I don't know if you can see it on the camera. Let's see if I can zoom in. So you can see just ever so slight that it's bigger at the bottom there. So that's enough to make a big gap. And then two, make sure you leave enough for the tenon. I might have cut this a little bit short, so I might have to do it again. But make sure you leave enough room so you can get a tenon on that. Here's that lower stretcher uh, cut with the tenon on it. And we got it fit into the leg. And you can see that that gap and angle is perfect to the leg. Okay, to make sure I got rid of those gaps, I just notch down on this a little bit. And what that does is it allows the stretcher to recess just a little bit, eliminating any gap. If you haven't seen how I did this procedure in the previous video, I'll make sure to leave that in the link in the description below. And so that's where we'll wrap it up for today. Now, if there's a particular tip or technique that I did that you found particularly interesting, uh, please leave that in the comments below because that helps me with future content and other videos. Also, if you're learning absolutely nothing from this video series, uh, please leave that in the comments below as well. Just go easy on me. I got sensitive feelings. Now, usually in my videos, I put a list of the tools that I used in them also down in that description. But what I started doing through the free newsletter was I started putting a link there over to my website where I have not only the tools used in this video, but in previous videos. And they're tools that I highly would recommend that anyone should have in their shop if they want to advance their woodworking skills. And of course, if you have a question on a project that you're doing in your shop, well, feel free to write me at woodshopintime at gmail.com. Because after all, my whole goal of this show, this series, is to make you a better woodworker. Until next time, thanks so much for watching and keep on dancing.